Rob Wolf, welcome back. Welcome back to the Optimal Performance Podcast. Huge honor to be here. I will bring down property values anytime you let me do it. So thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, I want to I want to start by talking specifically about Element. Um, you know, I think there there is you know you guys do a, such a good job explaining sort of the the conventional wisdom about sodium intake and how. Uh, we all have sort of bought into this idea that we just need to limit our salt. And um, I've been hearing that for a long time and, and you keep hearing it, but I know it's been an issue for me. So I would love to just to bring everybody up to speed. Obviously, full disclosure, everybody knows this. It's listening now. Element is a sponsor of the podcast. And um, uh, I really, I really like the product, but I really want to talk about, you know, that moment where you, where it's sort of, you really realized that it was an electrolyte issue that was keeping you from, from really like, um, reaching that sort of next level in performance. Can you tell us about that, that sort of moment that you had? Yeah. And I wish at that moment it happened like 20 years <laughs> earlier than what it did. Um, it would have probably solved a lot of problems that I experienced, but, uh, I guess for context, like I've been eating kind of a low carb ketogenic diet for about 22 years, um, started doing it in 1998 and I've tried some little forays here and there. Like I've tried like the safe starch deal and tried reintroducing legumes and stuff like that. But just to overall, I tend to feel best right, right at that, you know, kind of ketogenic, uh, uh, peri ketogenic level, um, Cognitively, I definitely feel best in lifting weights. I do well, uh, doing kind of uh, low intensity cardio. I do well, but any type of, uh, high intensity intervals, CrossFit or jujitsu, like I, I really struggled with it and all the way along, um, I, I would never bought into the notion that sodium was this, this really big problem from like a cardiovascular disease perspective, like early into to digging into low carb diets, I knew that they were remarkably effective at reducing blood pressure and mainly due to reducing insulin levels. And when insulin levels drop, then aldosterone levels drop. And, and then we stop retaining sodium and the blood, blood volume decreases. So it was, I was well acquainted with that. And the flip side of that, I was pretty well acquainted with too, like these, um, these low sodium diet interventions I have tracked for years and like, mm. they just don't really change blood pressure be, because I, uh, sodium is a piece in that story. And if you are already very high insulin and, and retaining water, more sodium, isn't going to make that better, but it doesn't really fix the underlying problem. You really need to, for you find what your glycemic load is and your appropriate caloric load to get to a, a you know, a spot where your insulin signaling is good. So I, I had, um, I, being a biochemist, I was reasonably well steeped in the metabolism of ketosis and, and, you know, kind of the physiology, um, because I kept up on the research at least a bit, I, I was not in the camp that eschewed sodium, but I had totally missed how important significant sodium was for really making that, that situation optimal. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I motored along for, for the better part of 20 years, just, you know, feeling pretty good other than when I exercised. And then when I would exercise, I was like, oh, do I need more carbs? Or, you know, like, how do I do this thing? I get all these cramps and stuff. And they started hanging out with these guys, Tyler Cartwright and Luis Villasenor, the guys that founded Keto Gains. And they're just great dudes, really good guys. They built this amazing community. And, and I don't think there's anybody on the planet that has coached more people in general, uh, using a ketogenic diet, but certainly in the format that they use, like this online boot camp format where mm -hmm. the, you know, they're communicating virtually and having these check-ins and the results that they were getting with, with folks were just jaw dropping, you know, and, and, uh, they're great guys are really knowledgeable. So I started kind of creeping them and hanging out with them and everything. And, uh, one day I was like, Hey, can you guys just look at what I'm doing and get a, you know, give me some feedback because I really struggle having that low gear doing jits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they looked at what I was doing and they're like, yeah, you're, you're pretty on point, but you need a lot more electrolytes, specifically sodium in one ear and out the other. I'm like, well, I, I, I salt the heck out of my food. I'm, I'm good. And I motored long for the better part of a year, still struggling. And then they were, you know, and I, I, you know, ask them again, like, oh, is there anything I'm missing? They're like, no man, really the sodium. And here's how we break it down. Like, you know, in, in like chronometer document everything and then look at, at what your electrolyte levels are specifically sodium. 
and here's what we want you to be at and you tell us where you're at. And I did it and I was like less than half of what they were recommending. Oh, wow. I was like, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> like I, I get it. And so then I ramped that up and we just did basically like kind of a homebrew deal where you do this much regular salt, this much potassium chloride, this much uh, magnesium citrate, like a, 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 what, what is that magnesium stuff? Uh, Ultra mag or something like that. A little bit of stevia, a mm -hmm. little bit of lemon juice, you, you know, mix it up, tastes good. And I did that and it was literally like a light switch was just flipped. I was like, oh my God, guys, like <laughs> electrolytes are critical. And they're like, yes, you're an yeah. idiot. And yeah. yeah. Yes, you, you know. And so I was all fired up. Like they had known this for five years, 10 years, and it was all like completely news to me, which is ironic. Uh, and, and it's really illustrative that no matter how much of, you know, kind of an authority or an expert you think you are on something, like there's always more to learn. Sure. There's always some, some, you know, or at least for me, maybe because I'm an idiot, I've, I've got all kinds of blind spots and what I'm looking at, but, um, I got all fired up about this. I'm like, we need to tell everybody about this. And so we, we brewed up this, uh, recipe for how to do the keto aid, like, like homebrew deal. And we posted it online and we had like a half million downloads of mm. this thing. Like it was super popular and people were like, man, we're really benefiting from this. But then we started getting tagged on social media where people were saying, Hey, this stuff is great. But when I went through TSA, they didn't like my three bags of white powder, <laughs> you know, which is kind of understandable. Huh. Yeah. Shocker. And, uh, so I was just, thinking, I wonder if like some sort of a convenient stick pack type of deal would, would be helpful. And so that's really like the Genesis story, mm. both for me personally, and then also for element itself. And, and honest to God, truth, the, the first flavor that we launched with the, uh, uh, uh citrus salt, mm. we formulated it such that if it sucked as an electrolyte, like if it just died, that we would rebrand it as like a margarita base. And so we Nice. formulated it as a drink base first and kind of an electrolyte second. And, you know, it's just kind of been off to the races since then. Like we've, um, we, we thought that we were mainly going to be catering to kind of the low carb ketogenic camp. And that's definitely like the center of our bullseye, but we've had, um, huge buy-in from like breastfeeding moms because mm. breast milk production is critically tied to sodium electrolyte balance fluid status uh this uh a uh, couple of different medical communities pots which is a uh, postural orth orthostatic tachycardia syndrome where people will go from seated to standing yeah. and they'll they'll pass out and so we've had really good buy-in from there so it's been fascinating where our our circle of influence has really grown way beyond just kind of like keto bros and gals who are, you know, trying to be lean and jacked and, and eat kind of a ketogenic lifestyle. Now we, we have all these, uh, professional sports t teams doing it. I mean, that was not really on our mm. radar at all, but we've, um, it's been fascinating. Like we, we give away a lot of samples and once people try it, yeah. uh, the cocaine <laughs> hit gets them and, <laughs> and it's kind of off and running. So, I mean, it's been a really fascinating experience, you know, the, the like three years that we've been doing this. Yeah. 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 I, th for me, th and I think for a lot of people, the, the supplements or nootropics that, that people take when you, when you can actually feel it kick in, that's, that's everything. Like it, no matter what your level of activity is or, you know, how much energy you, you're, you're using or not using, I think that for a lot of people, that when, you know, 15 or 20 minutes after ingestion, cert then suddenly you feel like, oh, wow, I feel like I, I feel like I could go for a run or I feel like I could right. actually focus or I feel like I can, I have the energy to like clean the house and just keep, keep, you know, keep things together. That sort of, that sort of energy boost from a, from a natural, like powdered supplement in a drink is my favorite stuff because you can't that you, when you have that experience, your, uh, your life changes. I mean, really, yeah. it, it really does. And, and for you, for a guy like you, who's like, you know, super active, you know, tons of content, family and doing jujitsu frequently, f like how many times a week? Three to five. Right. So, yeah. So yeah. like you're, you're finding that, like that next gear, that next level, and for some people, they're not, they're in, if you're like going from four to five, some folks are going from like one to two 
Mm-hmm. Um, and when they have this, th- that, that experience of like, wow, I feel like I have this natural energy that doesn't feel like anything else. It doesn't feel like coffee. It doesn't feel like chocolate. It doesn't feel, you know, like a stimulant. It just feels like I have this natural energy that, that's coming from inside me. That's the, to me, that's, that's the biggest thing. And, and, and I know that the listeners of this podcast and other folks who, who I coach, and I'm not, I'm not like a, a, a fitness coach, but I'm, I'm, I'm a life coach and performance coach. When they, when they try it and they immediately realize, oh my God, this is something that I've totally been missing. It just changes everything. Yeah. And it, 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 it's wacky because I mean, I'm, I'm a co-founder of the company. So like anything beneficial to it, clearly I have this like, you know, self interested deal, but as I've been noodling on this, um, I I did. So God, honest truth. Like when we first launched this thing, I told everybody, I'm like, I either think this thing's going to go pretty big or it's going to be like a plane into a mountainside. Like there's not really going to be any, any middle ground on this. It's not going to be this kind of whimpering thing that, that limps along. It's either going to fail immediately or I, I think it's actually going to go pretty well. And it's because I, I started noodling on God, if people really are sodium deficient and this sounds crazy in the modern kind of hyper palatable, highly processed food environment. So people get a lot of sodium attached to highly processed food. The sodium is problematic because it helps that highly processed food taste better, which causes you to eat more, which is a problem, you know, but like, is the sodium the problem or is it like kind of, kind of, you know, guilt by association? Once you get people to a spot where they're not really eating super processed foods, I think that most people benefit from more sodium intake, you know, and there's all kinds of epidemiological and historical studies around that. And as I started noodling on, I'm like, well, you know, you kept mentioning energy levels, which is fascinating. The way that we produce all energy in our body is through these sodium potassium pumps and ATP production. And the body is really fidgety about keeping those things in pretty tight balance. Like uh, pH is maybe more tightly regulated than that. And if they get off you, you could die or or feel really bad. Like pH is maybe even more tightly regulated, but man, if, um, sodium potassium levels get wonky and you are deficient sodium, things go bad in a hurry. And then if you, and then the, the interesting flip side of that is that in general, if you consume too much sodium, it's really kind of trivial for the kidneys to, to deal with that. Like at, at 15, 20 minutes later, you're back down to a normal baseline. Your sodium potassium ratios are pretty good. So it's, it's easily arguable from a toxicology standpoint that it's much more dangerous to be too low in sodium than too high. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is really defensible stuff. And then when you think about like the energy production, sodium, potassium pumps, electron ion gradient in, in mitochondria and everything, it's like, gosh, no wonder this, it, like people really do feel a little kick in the britches when they, when they get their sodium levels uh, right. And it, it, you know, and again, it's easy post hoc to go out and collect a bunch of things that like, Oh, well this supports it and that supports it. But it it is interesting that, um, adrenal fatigue treatment protocols almost uniformly, like first thing in the morning, they recommend a really big bolus of, of, uh, salt, Hmm. you know, as, as part of your deal. And it helps to normalize adrenal function. It normalizes blood sugar, uh, so it, it, it's interesting. And it, again, clearly a self-interested, you know, yeah. deal here, but, totally. but at this, but at the same time, I think there may actually be something to it, you well, know? So I, yeah. I, I, yeah. It seems to me like it's a, it's a systemic issue. Uh, and, and for, for people who have been told that they need to drink a gallon of water a day, no matter what their, um, you know, energy exertion is, mm-hmm. it's like, like how, how much of that plays into this, that, that we are potentially just as a, as a, uh, population, uh, just drinking too much water. Like how big of a thing is that? I, I think that's huge. Yeah. And that's where, um, folks will say, well, ancestrally, how did we get this much sodium? And I think that there are some sources, you know, like, uh, uh if, if you look at conventionally processed meat, the way that it's, it's bled at butchering, um, it, it, you get about a gram of sodium per kilogram of meat. Um, I think you could easily double that if we use more traditional methods where the animals are not bled and the sodium potassium is allowed to equi- equilibrate. Mm. That's still a pretty big gap there. 
And and so as I was noodling on that, I, I arrived at the similar position, which is that and this is again, it's it's like not only is it crazy bill, it's like, hey, you should probably consume more sodium. Yeah. Now we're kind of saying, oh, mechanistically, you're probably just consuming too many fluids. Right. And if you consume fluids, they should probably have some electrolyte in them more often than not. But I, I completely agree. Like if somebody was like, well, I don't know that I want to supplement with sodium all the time, but I kind of still feel like garbage then it may be that they just need to consume fewer fluids. Mm. Yeah. I, I yeah. think, I think it's a, it's been a problem for me and I, and I grew up, you know, we, my, my mom forced me to drink massive amounts of water. Uh, like, you know, we we're busy, busy kids. And I was, you know, I played, played elite sports and uh, I was constant, just constantly pushing fluids, just constantly drinking. Even when I wasn't thirsty, you know, we had these goals that we would, you know, these big water bottles that we would hit like before lunch and after lunch and eventually, you know, I got to a point where after, after a soccer game, I would have just like crippling gut cramps, like mm -hmm. just cr like absolutely just like cramping forward, super uncomfortable. Um, uh, and went to, went to my sports medical doctor and he's like, you know, you should, you should have some salt after you exercise. And at the time when I'm like a teenager, I was like, w why would I want, he's like, He's like, you're, you may just be in balance. You may just be, have too much water and not enough salt. And at the mo at that time it was like, that's crazy to think. He right. suggested that I eat potato chips, which was silly. Uh, but you know, in the, you know, <laughs> mid nineties, but, but delicious, yeah, <laughs> but good. Yeah, silly, but delicious, an ex, you know, excuse to eat uh, salt and vinegar, you know, Tim cascades, uh, right. potato chips after a soccer game. It was, it was an okay deal for me. But it did help immediately, like within mm -hmm. within moments of of me um, uh, balancing that out. So for me, it resonates, and and I think that because we have been told to drink, so you know, water. So you're made of water. You need to be drinking water. You need to, you know, it's important for your skin. We're just it's this, it's this narrative that I think has reached this critical mass, and and we may just be washing out and and creating that imbalance. Um, can you explain the difference between? Um, sodium minerals electrolytes like is because i think that's i think it's an important for it for people in their brain to sort of understand and, and and while you're explaining that if you could sort of explain the three basic ingredients that are they're in element that sort of that and, and why they're in those ratios sure sure so the electrolytes in general that that help to maintain ph to some degree but also just uh uh intracellular and extracellular fluid balance and also electrical conductivity in our body. So uh, with the, um, I guess, kind of the metal ion side of this, we have sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And then on the, the anion side, the negatively charged molecules or, or uh, uh, ions that we have in there, it's mainly bicarbonate, which we, we can get from the dissolved carbon dioxide in our blood. Um, chloride, phosphate to some degree, yeah, a little bit of phosphate to some degree, but those are the, those are the biggies. Like those end up playing a significant role in everything from like ATP production, like phosphate is used in, in different elements of, of ATP going to ADP and, and then back recycled to ATP. Uh, the sodium potassium pumps are part of what happens when we have an electrical conduction with a muscle contraction mm -hmm. or just a nerve firing each time your heart beats it's a you know some sodium potassium that they, they get pumped into gradients inside uh, uh different membrane compartments and so there's a lot of sodium in one spot and a lot of potassium in another and then when they run back together that we're we end up producing energy through that process and they just literally it, they are kind of the the ignition switch for life. Without mm. these gradients, um, it, it, life just grinds to a halt. You can't produce ATP and, and everything dies. Uh, on the mineral side, you know, there's all kinds of other things like um, molybdenum and, and uh, man, um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm totally blanking on on some of the other other stuff out there. But those are really kind of the the core um, electrolytes that, that uh, we're, we're generally concerned with. And when we were noodling on how to formulate this thing, like if you look at a lot of electrolyte formulas, 
they have all kinds of stuff in them and it, yeah. it, it looks kind of impressive you know they've got sand yeah. and copper and other, you know <laughs> right. all this stuff but what we did is we looked at about 200 250 people that were following that kind of keto gains approach whole foods minimally processed and we tracked, you know, their protein, carbs, fat, but more specific to this, we looked at how much electrolytes they were consuming. And what we found is that they, it, virtually everybody was fine on calcium. Like they, they really got adequate calcium. And also there's some kind of concerning literature that, that correlates calcium supplementation with cardiac events because calcium is involved in uh, kind of the atherosclerotic process and with clotting. Mm. And so... I'm still not exactly sure where I am with that, but there there have been a, a good, a decent number of studies now looking at people supplementing with calcium for like osteoporosis and then ending up with a, a remarkably high rate of cardiac events. And mm. so it looked like people were getting enough from diet and I'm kind of nervous about supplementing calcium. So we didn't add any calcium to it uh, because people were getting uh, the bulk of their food from minimally processed whole food sources they were pretty good on magnesium, but a little bit deficient and then similar on potassium. Like mm. they were pretty good, but there was kind of a, a gap there. But where they were really, really deficient was sodium, um, particularly if they're on the low carb side of things. If uh, uh, folks are legit, low carb, ketogenic, um, there's this process called the naturesis of fasting where mm. very, very low insulin levels cause us to have very low aldosterone levels. And so we tend to shed sodium like crazy. Huh. So the the demands of doing a ketogenic diet. And this is one of the funny things. Like if you or I are placed on a medically supervised ketogenic diet and a dietitian does their diligence in laying out a diet plan for us, we'll get somewhere between five and 10 grams of sodium a day by hook or by crook. Like they guarantee that it happens. And this is almost completely absent in the pop culture, mm. you know, discussion of low carb diets. It's like cut yeah. your carbs, get this amount of protein and then nobody talks about sodium at all, you right. know, and this is where people end up with the keto flu and all that. But we formulated element to just literally plug the, the holes <laughs> on a, a, an otherwise well formulated whole food diet. Yeah. I, I, let's is less a little bit of a less is more just enough minimum effective dose sort of protocol yep. right <laughs> like to yep. get to get yep. you back to where you need to be and not not overdoing it because you know we, we've talked at length on this on this podcast about magnesium um most of us are, are low in magnesium mm -hmm. um and, and the need to supplement it so to see it in there um yeah it just makes sense um what are what are some of the while we're on it? What are some of the symptoms of of low electrolytes? Um, like what besides the low energy or brain fog? Is there anything else that 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 somebody may be experiencing that they haven't made that connection that it's because of their their low in electrolytes? Yeah, it, and it's it's interesting. And this is I don't want to diverge too too far here because I'm getting old and it's hard to figure out how to tie in uh, <laughs> complex story arcs. But I'll I'll, I'll try to do my best. Um, when you dig into the medical literature, there is literally no, there, there are no known examples of people willingly dying from dehydration where they allow their, their body fluid level to get so low that they die. Hmm. It happens in extreme events, like somebody's lost out in the woods or they get trapped in a mine or something like that. But if people have access to any amount of, of hydration, they don't die from from a uh, lack of fluid intake, but there's a remarkable amount of documentation around people hyperhydrating, ending up in a hyponatremic state, a low sodium state. Yeah. And when that sodium potassium balance gets disrupted, the brain can swell, so you can have a headache and the the lethargy, and also just the electrical impulses for your brain, for the rest of your nervous system, for your muscles, they don't work well. Your heart uh, doesn't necessarily work well. So it's interesting that the the symptoms of legitimate dehydration of far of pathologically low uh, fluid volume are really similar to hyponatremia. But the danger here is that if you supplement water only in the individual that is hyponatremic, low sodium, you will kill them. Hmm. Like they, and this is this happens even in hospital settings and this is um so much of why 
people are given like it, an isotonic solution that has, you know, some so sodium, potassium, magnesium, a little bit of chloride in it. Because if the person doesn't necessarily need that, not a big deal. Your, the kidneys will sort it out. But if they do need it and you don't give it to them and you just give them a giant fluid bolus, yeah. it, it can kill the person. Mm. But the, the overlap between these things, and I actually did a couple of uh, blog posts for, for Element, and I can ping you those because they're really bullet, bullet pointed out. Yeah. But um, you detailed them, like lethargy, brain fog, cramping, uh, uh, headache, uh, GI disturbances. I mean, it's pretty broad ranging. But again, the, the overlap between the two are remarkably similar, and, and uh, uh, it, it's – it's just safer to tackle the hydration with some amount of electrolytes in it, more, more specifically sodium, because it, it's just the, the cautionary principle. If the individual is low sodium and you top them off with a bunch of water, you're, you're going to make the whole situation even worse. Mm. Whereas, it, you, you know, and so um, whereas the flip side, if they're adequate sodium, but you're, you're topping them off with sodium and water, the kidneys will sort that out and it's really not that big of a deal. And mm -hmm. it's worth mentioning that most good medical textbooks of physiology, when you look at the topic of hydration, it's the water and the electrolytes. And yeah. that is the combination, you know, that, that hydration is that, that combo. And somewhere along the line, we completely decoupled those things and we think about hydration only being, you know, pertaining to water. And we've yeah. kind of got a blind spot on the electrolyte thing. Well, all yeah. of us, all of us think that way. I mean, <laughs> I mean, even, even people who are, who are obsessed with performance, who are, I mean, at the highest level of their, of their game. And, you know, I, I know that you guys as a company don't like to name um, energy drinks and, and electrolyte drinks by name, but, you know, we, the marketing campaigns that go back to the Michael Jordan days, you know, drinking bright red liquids and shit. It's like... Here's an interesting, a possibly interesting aside. Uh, one of our uh, uh, ambassadors, VIP ambassadors, went to Florida State where Gatorade was developed, and they they went to like the Gatorade, you know, museum and all this stuff, and they they saw one of the bottles that was like the first. Or, or packages of the like the first Gatorade, mm -hmm. and you could you could see the front, you see the back, and it had a gram of sodium per per serving. Really? And yeah, no shit. Yeah. And so at one time, Gatorade was kind of kick ass. Like it probably <laughs> the the problem that I have with the sugar is that a small female may not have the same glucose demands is a super large male or if the person's doing highly glycolytic activity versus like steady state cardio so we just haven't played with adding carbohydrates to to the mix we recommend that if here we give people uh, some information about like here are the probable situations you might need and then you will need to customize it based off of your situation like i before i do jujitsu when i look out at the the crowd, if it's a bunch of old beat up has bins like me, I don't even take any glucose. But it, it, like the other day, there were like three retired Navy SEALs. There were a bunch of cops. There's <laughs> these kids who were who were like D1 wrestlers that have blue belts and stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm taking like 20 grams of, of <laughs> you know, glucose in the form of, of uh, these these diabetic glucose tabs. So huh. we didn't really enter into that. But it, it is worth mentioning, like Gatorade was pretty on point in yeah. its in its inception. And that's part of the reason why I think it worked so remarkably well. Again, maybe confirmation bias, but it's interesting. It had a gram of sodium per wow. serving. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, well it, well, it used to be just powder before they made the bottles, yep. right? It was just I mean, yep. when, when you know, growing up as an '80s kid in the '90s, it was just the powder. You could you you and yep. so it was easier to probably put put it in that form. Yep, yep. And I also I don't think people yet were as terrified by sodium, and so yeah. they they've kind of dialed the sodium down and the sugar up over the course of forty years, which is ironic. You know, it's uh, uh, somehow so. Sodium became bad and sugar became good in this whole this whole story, you know, which is kind of ironic. Yeah, yeah that is yeah. ironic. Uh, did I hallucinate or make this up in my mind that there is a, some connection between like electrolyte imbalance, not having enough electrolytes, and uh, peeing at night, waking up to piss at three a.m. like so many of us do? Yeah, you know it's interesting, and uh, Chris Masterjohn is really your guy for that. Like okay. he did a real deep dive on this and. 
the physiology is kind of complex, but the, you know, paring it down, um, inadequate sodium levels, even transiently, then we will tend to see an uptick in aldosterone that, that will cause a, a retention of sodium. But whenever we, we, the adrenal hormones are interesting in that if you release one, you tend to release all of them. So if aldosterone goes, then cortisol tends to go, uh, epinephrine tends to go, both cortisol and all, uh, epinephrine cause retention of sodium also. Hmm. And, and this is interesting, you know, like in adrenal fatigue and so many people who report kind of adrenal fatigue symptoms on low carb diets, their body is trying to retain sodium because they should be consuming more sodium. Ah. But in this, this like uh, nighttime peeing, a uh, nocturia or whatever it, it, it's called, what, what Chris Masterjohn recommended was just taking some plain table salt, uh, ideally non-iodized sure. and, um, uh, a quarter to a half teaspoon and just mix it in the barest amount of water to, to just make it soluble. You know, mm -hmm. like you don't, when you're trying to prevent peeing in the middle of the night, you don't want to you yeah, know, yeah. put it 16 <laughs> more ounces of water. So it's just a bare amount, um, swizzle that around, shoot it down. And what it does is it suppresses that, that aldosterone, uh, angiotensin, you know, axis, the whole adrenal cortical axis. And so people will tend to then sleep through the night. So if people were waking up mm. at like three, 3 AM all the time, they'll probably sleep to like 6 AM. Yeah. So they get that uninterrupted sleep. And, uh, within our healthy rebellion community, this has been, you know, like, uh, we've recommended some stuff like Ziva meditation, a twice a day meditation. And that's just been this massive impact for people. And I would say the pre bedtime salt shot has wow. been one of these things that I'm just kind of stupefied by how, powerful it is and that's for males or females but it seems in particular for males if they're having any of that like uh, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia type stuff and a yeah. little bit of uh, you know pee problems it seems to really legit help that yeah, yeah. I, I've, I I I don't remember where I heard it and um, you know I, I, maybe I made the connection somehow but um, one thing that I've been suggesting for coaching clients of mine is is, is not only you know because I love Element so much, I've suggested they 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 check it out. But then all, and then also, um, pinching your your pee stream while you pee to exercise yep. that that uh, uh, you start by doing it one. I mean, it says, and I've been doing this for years because I do not want to have you know I do not want to have piss issues. I I certainly don't want to be waking up at three o'clock every single morning in the middle of the night like right. like so many guys do who are you know thirty five plus thirty plus. Um, so like. Whole, halfway through your piss, you hold it for thirty seconds. It sucks in the beginning, but you get stronger, and then you work your well, you work your way up to doing it like three times uh, through every urination. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've suggested some people do that. They've started to do that, and now they do not wake up to pee anymore at three o'clock. Oh, interesting. And so, yeah. so the the electrolytes in in combination with being able to exercise that uh, that sphincter in your pee holes, like man, that's that's a game changer. Because how many people wake up to piss at three? They get frustrated that they're awake. They go pee and then they can't get back to sleep, or they have terrible right. sleep for that last couple of hours. And then yeah. that just becomes this downward spiral because I I think a lot of the I, I think probably the lack of uh, kind of pelvic floor exercise. We all start sitting and we don't mm. do as much dynamic movement. So that's probably a, a piece to it, but also this hyper insulinemic state, you know, this insulin resistant state really tracks with this, uh, uh, prostate issues. But then the, the really terrible thing is that when we start getting sleep deprived, our insulin resistance just skyrockets, uh -huh. which then begins this downward spiral on, on this thing. So like you, you wake up, you pee, you can't fall asleep. Your sleep sucks. You become more insulin resistant sure. and it just is this gnarly feed forward mechanism. Yeah. So I really like that. Actually, I'm going to make, make that recommendation in the, in our, our community, like, because the, the pelvic floor exercise just seems to be powerful for men and women for a whole host of issues. Yeah. 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 It sucks at first. I mean, nobody likes, yep. you know, can't stop what you started. I just want to pee. I just yeah. got to let me pee, man. <laughs> it works though. Um, uh, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot a lot more I want to get to with you. Um, um, you know, one thing that that I that I see people struggling with is you know uh, energy. They 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 want they 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 know they want they know they want to work out. Their gyms are probably closed. They 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 want to have the the, the boost in energy. 
and the motivation just to get through this sort of fear cycle that, that everybody's in. And, um, and you know, we don't have to go too deep into that, but, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, they don't have the energy to like be doing their own research. They don't have the energy to be exercising, to boost their resilience, to boost their immune system, to boost their mood, you know, let alone. And so I'm, I'm, I wonder about what, what sort of energy boosting hacks or biohacks or protocols or ideas are, are you, have you seen, cause you seem to have this endless energy and you're gonna go, nah, dude, I'm you know, falling apart. Don't, don't listen to me, but <laughs> uh, it's what, close to that. It's close <laughs> to that. Yeah. But what, I mean, what, what energy, what, what have you seen work for people when it comes to boosting their energy so that they have the ability to like live the life that they want? Uh, really, really good question. Uh, I, I, thinking of kind of two angles on this. The first is um, over the course of time, like I've always talked about the importance of sleep, but I wish that 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I couched my whole shtick in sleep and not like paleo nutrition or whatnot. Because mm -hmm. if you start from this premise of, hey man, and you detail all these benefits of sleep and all these gnarly downsides of not sleeping, you end up with a, a pretty interesting sales pitch there and kind of a, a defensible, non-religious kind of position. You're really hard charging type A corporate execs. They'll push back on it. They're like, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead and, you know, all this stuff. But there's some really interesting stuff there, you know, like uh, serial sleep deprivation, five days in a row, one hour of sleep deprivation each night, which new parents are kind of like, oh, my God, you know, it, yeah. it, a whole other deal but you are as as cognitively and physically impaired as as if you were at like a 0.1 blood alcohol level like you're 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 fucked up like wow. you're you're not op operating optimally the thing is is it happens over time so it's kind of like the frog in the hot water like you you just don't notice that you're becoming a hot mess and mm -hmm. so if we couch everything in terms of sleep it's like Okay, you're sedentary, you eat garbage, you stay up late, you're looking at a monitor. So we look at all this stuff and it's like, okay, we're going to start modifying all these things to improve your sleep. So we're going to deal with maybe we do some blue blockers in the evening. Maybe we do something like Flux on the, the computer. Maybe we get you off social media 99%, nine, nine, you know, so that you don't have that like stress adrenal, you know, response with that. And then when we get to, and then the person's like, yeah, I'm feeling better, but I'm still waking up. And it's like, well, let's get you a CGM and see what your blood glucose looks like. Holy shit, your, your blood glucose is all over the map and it's highs and lows. You need a low carb diet. And mm. now we're sneaking up on this thing in a completely indirect way. It's not the paleo diet nerd guy recommending low carb. It's like, hey, dude, this is your body. Your body yeah. sucks at dealing with carbohydrates, at least right now. So we've got to re reduce your glycemic load. So we need some more protein and some good quality fats. And so I think I'm at a spot now where anything that can be done that improves sleep quality will improve everything mm. else. And if we're not sleeping well, like, like some folks get up at like 4.30 in the morning to go work out and it's set and the, they'll be like, this is the only time I have to work out. And I really legitimately don't know if they're doing themselves any favor. Mm. Like I really don't know if sedentism is better than waking mm. up an hour, hour and a half early to go work out. Like I'm just not, I'm legitimately not sure about that. But those are, are just really plug in the gaps on sleep, I think are huge. And then this, this other thing that popped up in my life, like two and a half years ago, I've kind of dabbled with meditation, but uh, kind of stick. I, I don't know. It's kind of hokey. And then my wife tracked this thing down called, uh, uh stress less accomplish more by Emily Fletcher. And she has an online, uh, program called Ziva meditation. Mm -hmm. The online program is great. If you want to do it, it, it's phenomenal, but she's got like an $11 book and it, 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 uh, it's so interesting because like I checked out like Sam Harris's stuff and I like Sam Harris a lot, but, um, and he's a neuroscientist, but his pitch for meditation just didn't stick with me. Hmm. Like it was so uninspiring. I, it just didn't light a fire under me. And Emily's shit just really resonated with me. She she is a non-scientist who covers the science in a super accessible way, and it was really compelling. It is totally non-spiritual, no wavy gravy BS, <laughs> and and um and it's basically she she lays out this process where you you first thing in the morning 
you do this thing called come to your senses where you think about your smell and your taste, your hearing, your sight, and how you feel. Mm -hmm. And then you go through this thing where inhale and then exhale and you, you figure out a mantra. And it, it, my thing is just, I think, one, you know, oh, we're one big unit, happy universe. You know, it's mm -hmm. very simple. If um, thoughts enter my mind, I just let them go and I go back to just the breathing. I do that for like 15 minutes. And I do that in the morning and I do it in the afternoon. I've been doing it mm. two and two and a half years now. And uh, so that afternoon slump, you're feeling like shit. You're like, man, I don't have a lot of energy. I'll do that meditation. And I'm like, I, I just pop out of the chair. I am wow. ready to go. I, I, if I need to do more work, I'm good to go. If I, I hanging out with the kids, doing some exercise. Um, and I would say that the meditation practice has been as impactful, beneficially impactful on my life as ancestral eating. Wow. And I mean, I mean it, 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 and so I, and I make no money off of any of that, but like, I just can't recommend that enough. And wow. what, one of the main benefits that people report when they start doing this Eva meditation is that their sleep dramatically improves. Yeah, right. So it dovetails <laughs> back around into that that sleep thing. So I, ironically, I think if people are needing some more energy to motor through their day, adopting a twice a day meditation mm. practice, 15 minutes of whack and do it like hook or crook. Like if you got to like bind and gag your kids and pitch them in a closet or something like clearly not, but you know, I mean, it, it, what we do is we sit down with our kids and, and do the meditation with them. Oh, that's great. And some, some days they get up after five minutes and go wander away. I just tell them, Hey, please just give me my time to do this. You, yeah. you stay as long as you want. More often than not though, they stay there. Huh. And oddly enough, they are much, they're just centered and happier and I'm centered and happier. Um, my wife has made the observation that um, I am so much less reactive to the kids, to life stressors, all that type of stuff. Like there's just this buffer and it's not like I'm checked out or something, but it's just something happens and yeah. I actually get to choose my response instead of it just being this knee jerk, sure. like, like, you know, freak out and everything which then leaves more energy for everything else. Like yeah. if every little thing in my life isn't like wearing me down, then I, I think at the end of the day, you just are left with still more energy. So um, hopefully, hopefully that, that like every angle you can think of to improve your sleep and it, which will include food and time, time to bed and like, all, you know, circadian rhythm and all this, and then adopting a, a daily meditation practice. And I, I can't recommend the Ziva meditation enough. Like wow. it's just amazing. That's and insane. again, the book Stre stress less, accomplish more Buy it used Buy it on Amazon, whatever it's 11 bucks. And, and if you want to just like skim through it till you find the the page where she lays out how to do it, it's a page and a half. If you want to, just do that, but just fucking do that. Yeah. Like, like commit to doing that. And it'll be possibly like the greatest return on investment that people have ever done in their life on anything. It's crazy. Holy smokes. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah. What, what, what time in the afternoon do you usually sit down? Not a specific time in the okay. afternoon. Like I always do it first thing when I wake up, but then, um, usually my wife and I will kind of tag team on that. She'll do one or I'll do one. And, and, you know, just somewhere between like two and four, uh, you know, typically mm -hmm. somewhere in that window. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, that's, that's really, that's good. Um, what, uh, what sort of reoccurring themes, uh, are you seeing people, um, dealing with, um, in the healthy rebellion radio? Um, your, the, the format of the show is so great. Uh, it's so specific, you know, how, I don't, can't tell you how many times I'm like, Oh yeah, I've been, I've been wondering about that too. That specific thing. So I, I'm curious what, what sort of themes are people coming to you with that that seem to be, you know, consistent across across populations? Oh man, that's a good good question. Um, GI problems and the way to resolve them are a, an ongoing thing, and um, ironically, uh, shifting kind of. Um, oh, I think my phone's going off. Sorry, man. I thought I had this turned off. Um, right. uh, shifting more towards something that looks like carnivore. And I'm, I'm just like, you know, am uh -huh. I really saying this, but, um, yeah. I, I thought that this was just nuttery when it really was first spinning up. But, you know, my, my focus is really being kind of in that gut health autoimmune side of, of things like that's really been my passion. Cause that's been the stuff that I've really struggled with. Yeah. 
and I saw folks that had done paleo, autoimmune paleo, um, uh, uh, keto of, of all sorts. And they would get better, but they weren't like totally crushing life. And then like I, I went carnivore and it was everything fixed. And people with like horribly debilitating GI problems, neurological problems, autoimmunity. And uh, that so this. I, I'm seeing this trend that folks that are really legitimately sick and, and they've kind of turned over a lot of stones and maybe had a little bit of progress, but I'm finding people kind of migrating more that direction. Um, and then within kind of carnivore land, there's a lot, it's ironic that, that there's all these different ways, you know, some people do dairy, yeah. so other people don't, some people are like nose to tail. Other people are literally one, one cut of meat like ribeyes and, and they don't do anything else. And I see all of it work. Yeah. Uh, I have noticed that, uh, folks will frequently do pretty well carnivore plus a little bit of fruit, a little bit of citrus, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of have to play around a little bit, but the irony is that, um, uh, the big ass salad and stuff like that isn't so good for people mm. so it, it, in these scenarios. Some people crush it and do do really well on that, but this has just been this really interesting theme that I've I've seen played out. And and uh, I actually developed the autoimmune paleo protocol, and so it it was you know you could make the case that I would have some investment in kind of like defending <laughs> or firewalling that, but I've got to say. Um, carnivore is so simple by comparison like it, yeah. I, I think about like old testament and new testament type thing where there's like all these rules and autoimmune paleo you just it's mind-numbing to me to figure out why well, do you do this or you do that whereas like the carnivore thing is so simple yeah um and then people find that they maybe do okay with some fruit maybe a little bit of dairy and they they kind of push the outer boundaries but mainly they just stay really aware of um what's their GI function like? And then what's their overall symptoms? Like if they're, they're dealing with some sort of health issues like depression or something like that. Yeah. And that's definitely been a recurring theme is, is, uh, seeing a, a yeah. good number of people that have had uh, really long standing health issues kind of benefiting from migrating a little bit more towards the uh, carnivore side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you at on it? In your turn, in terms of your personal consumption. I have gone ever closer to, yeah, what to does that. that. What, I'm, I'm what, what does that mean, though? Like a little broccoli with dinner and, and I, or broccoli like... kind of tears me up now. I'm, I'm realizing that although my so I had ulcerative colitis 22 years ago that got me heading down this path, and I always ate a ton of veggies, and I always had pretty loose stools. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've never been constipated in my life, and. Um, and I think it's the goddamn vegetables. Yeah. Like I, I, I'll, I'll do a little bit of white rice here and there. And I mean, it, it, it's like a quarter cup or something. Like I'm, I'm not super carb tolerant, but I'll do a little bit of white rice. I do a fair amount of dairy now. Um, citrus fruit, I seem to do really well with. Uh, watermelon, I do pretty well with. Papaya, when it's in season, I do well with. Apples and pears are terrible for me. They just absolutely, like, they come out the same way they went in. Huh. Um, Berries are a mixed bag. Some berries I do pretty well. Some of them not so great. Blueberries I don't do that great with. Blackberries I do really well with. So, I, I, you know, um, uh, it, it's mainly meat, seafood, dairy products, and then just a spattering of um, uh, mainly a little bit of fruit here and there. I do pretty well with um, artichokes and asparagus. Hmm. Avocados, okay. Um Guacamole, I don't do that well with because I finally accepted that like I don't do well with with garlic. Like I, I oh, no. fought it and fought it and fought it, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, I don't. I, huh. Big whack of garlic will light me up, and it, it's just like it's that loose stools thing again. Yeah. And, and I notice um, if things get kind of loose, and I'm I'm kind of wondering if it's an electrolyte deal because I'm not reabsorbing the the fluid in the GI tract, but I just feel bad. Like kind of neurologically, I'm kind of lethargic and yeah. flat and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, t today's the first day of all meat April, man. Uh, oh wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, who uh, uh, Doctor Doctor Sean Baker is 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 promoting it. Um, yeah. I mean, we've we, we we touched on this last time. We touched a lot on regenerative farming. You know, since then I've had Anya Fernal from uh, Bill Campo on. Mm -hmm. um, you know. You know, I, I follow really closely. You know, uh, Dr. John Jake Wish, the X3 uh, creator. Yep. He and I, you know, talk quite a lot. And now he's uh, he's advocating for dry fasting. I don't know if you've seen any mm -hmm. of his posts talking about dry yeah. fasting. 
yeah. pretty fascinating, you know, um, doing carnivore, uh, OMAD carnivore with the product that he developed, the um, uh, Fortigen, which uh, for, for me, I really like, you know, following that one milligram or one gram of protein per pound, bo- per, per pound body weight per day, which mm-hmm. I, I try to follow pretty closely because I want to, you know, I'm that guy that wants to build, build lean muscle and lift yep. heavy shit. Uh, um, interesting. I, you know, I, I think there's, I, the, the, the ease of it, the simplicity of it, uh, is accessible for people. The fact that it just completely eradicates, you know, seed oils and sugar and all these other things that can screw people up. And, you know, the fact that, you know, veg, there's some, that vegetables can be toxic for, for people in a lot of different ways. You know, the, the things that, uh, that, that people are, are just not tolerating as well anymore fascinating for me um cool do you do any yeah, organ- and, yeah do you do any organ meat i i do but so we do this uh o- oful blend so the the folks that we go with they take like a pound of ground beef and a pound of liver heart other fiddly bits and they they mix it together and so i'll take that one pound of the mix and then mix it with two pounds of regular ground beef yeah. and that will be our taco base and Ooh. then also like marinara base and stuff like that so um and the kids will smash that but I, i've got to admit um i've had organ meats i've not had organ meats i don't really notice a difference personally mm-hmm. and and again um I, I will take some lime and like put some lime juice in my water uh i'll, I'll eat some citrus most days, like I'll, I'll have an orange, maybe two, you know, maybe more than that if I'm if I'm doing hard jujitsu or something. So I may be rounding stuff out well enough elsewhere. But then you have people like Sean Baker that he's, he, you know, he doesn't do any organ meats and and uh, he's he's crushing it. I'm I'm really, it's a perplexing um, spot for me. I had Michaela Peterson on my podcast and we kind of went through her blood work and. She had normal vitamin C levels, normal B vitamin levels, iron, zinc, you know, all this stuff. I don't think that's, it's going to work for everybody. I mean, the same caveats apply, you know, uh, some people rock a vegan diet. I think a lot of people struggle with it. I don't know that carnivore is the end all be all for everybody. And I do advocate for having as much latitude in your diet as you can, such that it, it, you know, it works best for you. But, um, yeah, the, the organ meat, I, I would have to say I'm more on the it's optional and not necessary versus the like emphatic you must eat brain and liver and spleen and everything at each meal or you're you're somehow going to end up nutrient deficient. Like I'm just I'm just not seeing it in folks and, and certainly haven't experienced it myself. Yeah. yeah. Is yeah. Michaela Peterson doing just the ribeyes? Is she doing? As far as I know. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and so that's what I call one cut carnivore. You one know, it's carnivore. like, they, yeah, they, they, uh, <laughs> settled on this, you know, and, and I know, uh, Sean Baker has more latitude than that. Like he'll do some scrambled eggs and some right. dairy and different things, but he's, he's pretty, pretty ribeye esque, but yeah, I mean, Michaela, and then who's the, uh, Charlene Anderson, I want to say she's a, a woman that's pretty, pretty well known within the carnivore scene. And she's been doing this 22 years and put, really, really bad uh, rheumatoid arthritis into remission, and she's gorgeous. Like, yeah. She's like early 60s or something. She's yeah. Hot, you know? yeah. 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 I'm doing just the, just the fatty, just the fatty ribeyes. Yeah. So you don't, you yep. don't touch chicken ever? No, I, I do some chicken. Oh, so do. I am not in the, uh, I love Paul Saladino, but I think he's gone a little, little crazy on that, that side of things. Um, uh, and, and also it's kind of within this whole spectrum. Um, I'm not eating bagels. I'm not eating deep fried food. <laughs> So I'm gonna eat some fucking pork and chicken here and there, and yeah. I, it, you know, and it, yeah. it, it, it's like I'm just not gonna gonna sweat that that much. From a, it, I would make a better case from a sustainability perspective to eschew yeah. chicken and pork than than the uh, the kind of trivial amounts of mono and sat or polyunsaturated fats you're getting there. But yeah. again, that's kind of my my bias. When, on I, that. when yeah. I first saw Sean Baker making chaffles, I thought, oh, he's really stepping out of the stepping out of the paradigm a bit. But uh, I haven't yet to make them. Do you make chaffles ever? We haven't done that. Yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just love saying the word chaffle. I know, I know. There's something uh, <laughs> uh, just satisfying about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's. How, how are you doing for time? I just want to make good. Want to be conscious good. of it. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that you guys, a, a concept that 
that you sort of lead with uh, within uh, the Healthy Rebellion Radio is uh, resilient aging. Um, how do you define resilient aging? Oh man, how would I define it? Um, I think it's it's being as prepared for whatever comes your way as you can. You know, whether it's physical challenges, emotional challenges. Uh, uh, you know, one one thing that does seem to be fairly consistent with aging is is uh, people begin narrowing their social circles. They begin narrowing their experiential circles. And some of that is that you just get busy and you get worn down and you're tired. And I, I know like raising my kids, like by the time they go to bed, like there was this time when they both went to bed at like 630 and they slept 12 hours. And it's like, that was pretty easy, you know, and and uh, they're getting older and it's, it's fun in a lot of ways, but they're like, I want to stay up and go outside and look at the stars. And it's like, well, I want to go to bed, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, and we, we now live in the mountains of, of Montana and yeah. we, we just had video of a mountain lion outside of our, our house. So, uh, so you're not going to go out camp? on the back porch right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A big one. Like, oh. big one. Yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, so I, and I think that that lack of pressure testing your boundaries leads to a lack of resilience. And then when you get forced into a difficult situation, like you're just that much less able to, mm. uh, to deal with it. But, um, this is where I think doing like some weight training, a little bit of interval training, something like jujitsu or like a, 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 any yeah. type of martial art ready, but you know, uh, Thai boxing, even if you're just hitting pads and bags, like something where it's changing and you got to be dynamic and you're, you're dealing with, with real stuff coming at you, you know, it is uh, really beneficial. Um, I've been cracking back into my old uh, physics and calculus textbooks and just kind of trying to dust off the, 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 you know, the fog with that because my, my, my kids are eight and six, but both of them seem to really dig math and seem to have a bit of an aptitude for it. Mm. And we're homeschooling. So I'm like, okay, I got to step my game up here. We're going to, you know, I'm going to be in deep water here in the next couple of years. But um, I think doing stuff like that, language, uh, tinkering with languages, like anything, we're just getting some novel experience so that it, it keeps you fresh. I think that that definitely feeds into resilient aging. But I guess if we, we had kind of an elevator pitch, it's just being prepared to do it, anything that, that life throws at you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think that sort of that's a great concept for everybody right now it's just to stay flexible just to be prepared you know to, to think to think ahead you know your uh, forgive me for not knowing the context for the move out to montana but just with the exodus of people that are moving specifically to austin <laughs> and right there, and there goes rob and nikki like and that was a little bit of the reason like we we grew up in kind of a mountainous northern california uh north uh northeastern nevada area so that was kind of where we were from. And I, uh, I was intrigued by Texas and it's, it's very cool. Um, it, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there, but, um, New Braunfels is, uh, halfway between San Antonio and Austin and with COVID and kind of the social unrest and different things like that. Like, although it felt rural, we were smack dab in the middle of an area that has like five or 8 million people, you know, and there was just a lot more bodies around there than I was really mm. comfortable with, you know, if things really got squirrely and sideways and, uh, and yeah, a bunch of people were moving to Austin. So I figured <laughs> I might as well go somewhere else. And, and, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it brought us closer to family. Yeah. Um, cool. our, our jujitsu organization, straight blast gym, they have three gyms in this area. Each one of them has like 400 members, wow. and, which for the people running jujitsu schools are like, how the fuck did they do that? Yeah. Um, they don't murder people. They have a system, uh -huh. they onboard people. Like you don't just let people roll in the day one and like throw them to throw them to the wolves. Like if you want to run a good gym, then I would, I would put an eye towards what those folks are doing and you're going to have to modify the way that you do things. But we had instant community with the gyms. We were closer to family and, uh, uh, I guess kind of the, the mountainous, uh, wilderness type area is just kind of more our, our shtick for sure. So yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, and when you do, when you, you know, when you're diversified in your projects and activities, the way that you are, you have the flexibility to, you know, to, to pick up and go, you know? Right. Start, right. Yeah. We're super lucky in that new. regard. Beautiful. Yeah. This, this is a related question to family and, you know, obviously I, I have so much respect for the way that you move through the world and the things that you work on. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm just sort of curious and you feel free to fucking pass on this question if you want to, but 
you know, I, I'm curious about how the men that I respect are talking to their children about COVID and, mm. and how they're talking to their children about mask wearing. And if, if you're comfortable sort of speaking either generally or specifically about how, how you're communicating to your children, you know, obviously with homeschooling, you have, there's, 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 you're contained a little bit, you know, and my kids are um, eight, five, uh, very similar. And, you know, we, we have, we're homeschooling now. They're going to be going to a Waldorf school here, here uh, close by. But I, I, we're, I know the way that I'm talking about it at my house. And I, mm-hmm. so I, you know, from, from dad to dad, I'm sort of, sort of curious about how, how you're handling it, how you're talking about it, you know, what your attitude toward masks is. And again, if you want to take a hard pass, please, that's okay. Yeah. It, you know what? Let me pause one second or, well, my wife pressed play on the uh, printer. I apologize oh, about I can't that. Even hear um, it. Okay, cool. Uh, you know, early in the COVID deal, I don't think anybody knew what was up, you know, one way or the other in the first two, three weeks when everything started really ramping up. Like, interestingly, we were in Costa Rica end of February, beginning of March last year. And, um, and it just so happened while we were in Costa Rica, our, our, uh, we decided to move when we got back. And so we ended up moving right at the height of, of COVID, like in the middle of April. And it, it was it was crazy. Like uh, we did three moves in two years, two of them cross country, uh, two of them during a, a pandemic. And so, like, I, I don't want to ever move again. But um, we were really honest with the kids and we explained, I think, to the best of our ability. Here's what we understand. Like there's this virus. Kids knew about viruses for, you know, we talked about washing their hands and, and, you know, if they were sick, they would, both of them did go to Montessori for a couple of years. And, you know, if they were sick, they stayed home and wash your hands when you use the drinking fountain, try not to French kiss it because you're going to get <laughs> fucking sick, you know, and, and, uh, but really early in this thing, and this will probably get me canceled, but, um, I started having some real misgivings about the way all this stuff was rolling out. Like, when I started hearing that the vaccine was our, our singular hope in this whole, whole thing, I was kind of like, wait a second here. Like at that point, there had never been a vaccine su- successfully produced for the SARS-CoV family of viruses. Like it had never, never been successful. They tried to do it for MERS and for SARS-1 and it, it, it failed catastrophically. Um, I thought back to HIV research, like we're 40 years down downrange on on HIV and they still haven't developed a, a vaccine for it but right. it's being managed with with pharmaceuticals you know these protease inhibitors and very very well and there was not a single word about any of that that was that was discussed and so we talked about all of that stuff with the kids you know and uh, I'm sure some people will be like oh you're horrible parents and you you know but we we tried to you know we mentioned that there were definitely some at-risk people that, that, you know, um, people in uh, retirement homes, people who are metabolically unhealthy, and we talk to them about the work that we do, and we try to help people get healthier. And it was pretty clear early on that people with metabolic disease fared far worse than the people without it, and that the people without metabolic disease, COVID might be like a, a really bad cold or a, a, a decent case of the flu and not a potentially life-threatening, you know, kind of occurrence. So we we talked about that. Uh, in the area that we were in, in Texas, um, it was pretty relaxed with regards to mask wearing, um, the jujitsu place we went to, it was basically, we had a big group discussion via Mm -hmm. online and it's like, this is what we want to do. If you want to wear a mask while rolling, then by all means do it. The people who don't want to don't, if you have even an inkling that you've got a sore throat or runny nose or something, stay home. And everybody was like, cool, that seems totally reasonable. And, uh, and our kids absolutely detest wearing masks. Like they, it was just the heat and the, the you know, kind of stifling feature and not really being able to see people's uh, uh, faces and kind of the emotionality and everything. You know, they commented on that. They're like, Dad, I don't know what that person is really saying, you know? And, and uh, so we talked about all of that stuff. And I, I definitely have a bias, but I really tried to couch things in, you know, these people are coming from this position and these people are coming from this position and, um, uh, tried to lay out at least a little bit of a, a, I guess, balanced perspective, but I, I definitely have a, a bias on the whole thing. Like I, I think that, you know, it's been used to political ends. I think it's been used to terrorize us and, and, uh, 
Um, if this thing really was the existential threat that it was being suggested that it was, then we would have never relied solely on a vaccine as, as the sole, you know, remedy in, in this thing. You know, it was nearly career suicide to ask questions around, like, are there any off off uh labeled drugs that could be used in, in mitigating this yeah. process. And only now is that a topic that you can discuss and not get your, your head lopped off, you right. know? So, uh, yeah, we talked about all of that, that stuff and, yeah. and, you know, kind of the, the perspective that, that people would, would take on things. We talk a lot about just risk in general and, you know, why do we wear seatbelts? You know, well, if you get in a car accident and you're not wearing a seatbelt, there is a damn high likelihood that you're either going to die or get much more severely injured. And there are some super libertarian people are like, I'm not going to wear my damn seatbelt or, or wear a motorcycle helmet. And I'm like, hey, I'm pretty libertarian, but you're an idiot, dude. Yeah. Like this is it, OK. Yeah, it is a law. But this is just like this just makes sense. It's kind of like you're going to walk through fire ants and you don't want to wear shoes. It's yeah. like give me a break, you know. Right. So um but people look at masks that way, too. Like, I'm pretty unimpressed with both lockdowns and masks as mitigating strategies. Like, I'm – and maybe I'm 100 percent wrong, but I, I – when you really look at places that buttoned up tight as a drum and they were having people wear three masks and you compare them to other places that were more open and, and maybe didn't even have any mask mandates uh, – the, the end results are not markedly different, you know, and it, 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 except on economic out, outcomes and uh, the impact on kids, you know, like this distance learning stuff and, and yeah. uh, what's rolling out in schools. It's um, it's going to be a mess. Like our, our school systems were already pretty rough and American kids don't do that well academically compared to most other countries. And we're just going to be so hosed after this. Like I can't even – it's hard to imagine which end is up. So that's probably way more than what you wanted. No, but that's what I it, wanted. Yeah, we, we talked about all of this stuff yeah, with the kids. That, yeah, that, that, is, that is what I wanted. I, 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 was, I, was, I was curious. And, and this, we don't need to go, we don't need to go down the rabbit hole here. We don't need to, I mean, generally speaking, I think talking about there is an opportunity to, for leadership, for the three-letter entities and for governmental entities to to talk about wellness, to talk about health, to talk about resilience and nutrition and not hand out donuts for getting your, your vaccine. I, I, I think back <laughs> about like the, uh, the John F. Kennedy, you know, we're going to put man on the moon and bring him back in 10 yeah, years man. deal. Yes. And there, was, and there was this opportunity to be like, we don't know – the far reaching consequences of this virus, but we're pretty sure that people who are metabolically healthy fare better. And I mean, the earliest days there was information coming out of right. Wuhan, China, and also just looking at influenza and, and a host of other infectious diseases, people with high blood sugar, people with high blood pressure, people with pulmonary issues, they all fare poorer. Yeah. The morbidity and mortality is higher. It was a, a hundred percent safe bet that if we made it's like, if you want to pick paleo, if you want to pick low carb, if you want to pick vegan, do whatever you can, but get yourself and your community healthy. Like there was an opportunity to do that. Yeah. There was nothing, you know, and, and that is another layer to this thing that I'm like, if this was really an existential threat, then we should have all been rallied together as a country to get healthy. And, and there was nothing hmm. with that. I mean, literally nothing related S to that. Still, still nothing. Still nothing. Still, yeah. It, it's lunatic fringe like you and myself that are saying maybe being metabolically healthy would would be beneficial here you know and um and and whether you wear a mask or don't wear a mask or isolate or don't isolate like that that is a, a that is a guaranteed take home that you're going to improve your resiliency you know back to to that question yeah, yeah. so that's another ass chapping feature to this thing it's like <laughs> Nobody in public health, like I think Dr. Fauci, and again, I don't want to get too out in the weeds on this, but um, one time in his interviews, in all of his many, many interviews, one time he said, people should definitely eat better and get healthier. That's it, you know? And, and, uh, and so I think a massive opportunity lost there. And it's it, unconscionable when you consider everything else that has happened and everything that's going on. And, yeah. and how... Um, years forward, we could have been at that moment, like, okay, fuck yeah, I'm going to lose the 50 pounds and, and, you know, get healthier. And, and my, even though we have to do X, Y, Z, like we're going to do it as a family and we're all going to eat better and we're not going to just bury ourselves with processed food and everything, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, 
the data continue what well, the day the data there, the, there's such a such a mess of d possible data that you can follow or not follow so like even even just saying the data when in terms of this conversation just saying the data is already a loaded <laughs> start right. you right. know because because it just it just is but you know we're now getting reports that you know 80 percent of the deaths were from people who were obese and, and we keep getting this reinforcement, this message over and over and over. If you're, if you're, if you're carrying extra weight, if you're already unhealthy, you know, Sh Sean Baker has been, been, you know, charging pretty hard on the fact that the, that the, um, the shedding from obese populations from bigger people is more, it's just, it's stronger. It's, it, mm -hmm. it lasts longer. So, um, not to demonize people who are having a tough time, you know, keeping their health in check, but it's just uh, the, you're right there. When you said, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy and, and the, the trip to the moon, I was thinking that that's the sort of opportunity that we that we are being presented with. It's like this waking up moment to the reality that we, uh, as a as a culture, need to make some changes nutritionally. We need to make some changes as far as our lifestyle. And it just hasn't happened. Maybe it will happen. You know, maybe 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 there there are enough um, lunatic fringe like like us um, and other folks who I really am, am inspired by who are advocating for healthier lifestyles and um, building up their their innate um, uh, immune systems, their resilience in general. But well, maybe potentially we 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 we're, there is still the opportunity there to be you know to advocate. So, well, I thank you for going down that short deviation with me because I, I am I am curious how how other how other folks are handling it. A um, couple couple other questions here, and um, one question is the wellness trackers, the um, remote go get your blood drawn, send it in, and get get diagnostic advice and some coaching. Um, plug in your 23andMe data to get you know a greater picture. Um, are you a fan of those platforms? Do you have do you have favorites? Um, do you do you feel this is sort of like a future forward looking you mm -hmm. know the individualization mm -hmm. of of our uh, of our medical system, our our own personal health being increasingly individualized, increasingly virtual and remote. Do you do you do you love it? Do you think yeah it's it's worth a little bit? Maybe not as important as X or Y, but there, I just see so many of them, and, and I've participated recently um, with one of these companies and, and d done my blood, so I'm now having a firsthand experience in it. So I'm just curious, like, what what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I've done most of them. Um, you know, like 23andMe is pretty cool, but it was mainly cool for me in tracking down lost relatives that and figuring out that I have a story to my family tree that wasn't part of family folklore at all, and that was that was super interesting. Um, it, it's some of the health stuff, it kind of confirmed to some degree some some dietary practices. And then in, in other circumstances, I think so much of the information, like none of these studies that they kind of tie into this, nobody's eating a ketogenic diet. Nobody's eating an ancestral diet. So like high fat is kind of meaningless. And, you, you know, it's all high fat in these contexts is always like this high fat, high carb processed food deal. It's, mm. it's never like olive oil and butter and stuff like that, you know? So it's, it's hard to, to pin that stuff down. Um, I like blood glucose monitoring. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I think that some interesting insights can be had from that. Uh, I really like this outfit called precision health reports mm. and they do an LPIR score, a lipoprotein insulin resistance score. And, uh, I think that it provides the most accurate assessment of cardiovascular and diabetes risk that is available. And, and when you look at, so, so within, you know, COVID or, or just a host of different things like that diabetes risk profile, insulin resistance, like that is so much ends up happening there. So like if you're having problems there and you can really accurately assess that, I, I think that it's very powerful in making some changes. Um, Trying to think of what else. Uh, I, I will say this, though. I think that people get overly wrapped around the axle of, like, the wearables and, and trackers. Like, I was I was wearing one a lot, and I, I liked it. But then when I would go to bed, I would read, and it would interpret my reading as sleep latency. So then it would give me a shitty score. 
And so then uh, on like my HRV, and so then I would take it off until I actually fell asleep and put it back on and then I would get a better score. And I, I think that these things are valuable up to a point, but um, so many of them, I, I just wish people would be like in their own skin and like have some yeah. objective metrics. Like how many pull-ups can you do? How ah. fast can you run a quarter mile? You know, and like, and if you're it, making some improvement or at least not backsliding in those areas, you're probably doing pretty well. So yeah. I, what, I, what, yeah. what about, what about, um, I'm thinking like, um, you know, inside tracker, uh, wellness FX, these sort of like you do the blood work and then you get the coaching. Cause, cause I'm, I'm with you too. And I, I'm the, the term that I sort of hang my hat on is this uh, interoception. How do I feel mm -hmm. today? How much energy do I right. have? Does how does my gut feel like, like what that, that I, <laughs> and how many pull-ups can I do? What's my, right. You know, how, how, can I pick up my kids still? You know, like these sorts of things. But um, right. I, I tend, I'm seeing, I'm seeing more and more of these of these companies. This you know, remote blood work, and then like subsequent coaching, and in you know, companies like Viome that are doing it with stools and so and so forth. I'm just, I'm curious if you've done those, and if and if you've gotten anything out of those. I, I have, and I, I like all those folks, and 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 I also have found limited utility in in a lot of them. Um, I think that the worldview, the framework that's being used to interpret the blood work is really huge. And although mm. you have to go by evidence-based standards at the same time, um, I really am a fan of this kind of evolutionary biology, ancestral health kind of perspective. And out of out of all of that, that pool of things, this uh, uh, Precision Health Reports is kind of the only folks that I know of that mm. that have that in, in their back pocket as an orientation when they're thinking about this stuff, when they're really looking at both the evidence-based guidelines and kind of customizing to you specifically. Um, I think that the gut testing, how do I want to say this? Um, well, you biome is a good example. It's another, it's another one of these Theranos things where it was absolute smoke and mirrors. And, and, uh, I, I would say I was possibly one of the earlier people in this whole scene that was like, hey, gut health is really, really, really important. And that's all I can still say about it. Like, <laughs> people will go on and on about like, oh, Ackermantia this and uh, soluble fiber that. And I think it's kind of bullshit. Huh. You know, it, it uh, uh, from a clinical outcome perspective, I've seen too many people resolve massive GI and other issues by completely removing all types of fiber and and maybe their gut biota changes but if you sneeze your gut biota changes if you watch a <laughs> scary movie your gut biota sure. changes so you're taking a snapshot of something that's a 3d movie you know and yeah. it's like that's supposed to inform something that's sure. ridiculous just when i learned how labile the gut was then i was like oh this just needs to be driven to clinical endpoints mm. like are you sick or not? If you are mm -hmm. sick and having problems, then here's our logic tree that we go through to try to resolve that. But to, to I think we're so far away from being able to um, take a stool sample and then, you know, do some genetic testing and have some some deep insight in that. You know, genetic testing was supposed to revolutionize the world. Like the hmm. the, the first human right. genome was was completely mapped in, I think, 2001 or something. And this was supposed to set the world on fire we were going to solve cancer and everything almost nothing has happened as it's, a consequence of it well but other other than meeting relatives other than meeting relatives and finding out that your dad maybe wasn't really your dad and stuff like that <laughs> you know and and um which i have an interesting story about that huh. i'll share with you in in the next next show not mine personally but a friend but um and that's it and so and part of the problem is that the genetic information is so massive that it's just like you don't know what how to make heads or tails of it. And part of the reason for that is the epigenetic signaling that turns those genes on and off is mediated by our gut, by our diet, by our exercise. So you keep layering orders of magnitude greater complexities and they're multiplicative hmm. and we're and i don't know maybe at some point machine learning is really able to get in and make some sense of that but even that i'm not entirely sure what, how because it changes all the time right. so i'm i'm really underwhelmed um 
by the insight that a lot of this stuff provides. Like, I think it's kind of cool to do. It could provide a cool benchmark. I think benchmarking things is, is kind of cool. So like if, if you go do a gut analysis and you've got a baseline and then you go to Mexico and you catch Giardia and then things are all screwed up and you get it retested and things are really different, that could provide some interesting insight. Maybe you, you could use that to kind of benchmark what you're doing from a treatment perspective. But, um, I'm, I'm really just unimpressed by that stuff relative to somebody who's just a really good clinician. And like, if you're, if you're having problems, it's like, well, let's try us, you know, removing FODMAPs or let's try a, a histamine diet or whatever. And, and again, there may be a, a time where we're able to better prescribe that based off of genetic and epigenetic testing. But in my opinion, I think we are yeah. just miles away from that. Like it's so far away and each each layer of additional information we add in. Uh, Nassim Talib talks about this, and also um, it was talked about in the the book Blink. Like imaging, it, medical imaging has progressed so much, and like our ability, even they they were talking about like the ability to land pinpoint accuracy, you know, like cruise missiles and stuff like that. It hasn't really improved things all that much. Like we just have that much more information that we don't really know what to do with, right. you know? And, and there was all this like super high level imaging of people, uh, 10 different oncologists. And they had like, I think a hundred different patients with either, either with or without cancer. And there was absolutely no consensus among these folks at all. About, <laughs> really? like, they compared them and there was nothing, nothing. And this is possibly where some machine learning will, will come in. There is some, preliminary stuff that that suggests that uh machine learning is better than than meat bot human doctors at diagnosing right. stuff yeah. because it, it you know it, it it's very detailed and it's unbiased and whatnot so that might be a direction where we get some 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 insight on that but um yeah and this is why i'm probably never going to be on the board of directors of any of these <laughs> These things, because I'm just like so underwhelmed by the the vast majority of them. This uh, Precision Health Reports is about the only one that really kind of knocked my socks off, and it, it's it's derivative of the work that we did with the Reno Risk Assessment Program. Like it uses the same methodology that that was used in that context. So maybe I'm biased that way, or maybe it's just because I'm more comfortable with it. But I I've, I've seen that provide mm -hmm. some really great insight both on cardiovascular disease and also type two diabetes. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you know, drinking from a fire hose of information is is fine, but but if you don't have someone to help you translate, if you don't have a, a skilled, like you said, a skilled clinician to say, okay, here are some suggestions of changes that you should make. Here's how you do it. Here's how you should test it. Here's how it works over time, et cetera, et cetera. Then, without that, you're you're you just have a bunch more information and right then you're fucking overwhelmed. You're already overwhelmed. So you, right. know, you just have increased overwhelming because you have lactobacillus aflori, you know, overgrowth. And what the fuck does that mean anyway? <laughs> like, right. I don't know. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm optimistic about the, now we have these tools, we have these data, we have these, you know, machine learning and AI to, to help open up the door so now that the door has been opened, what are the next steps they're going to actually yeah. make actual changes for people in their life? And I and I think that it that's going to take some some humanness to to ask the right questions and to you know I don't know I'm I'm opt I'm optimistic about it, but you know I've I've seen I've seen a couple people get pretty be feel pretty let down by the level of data that they get and the suggestions mm -hmm. that they're giving. It's like, well, this is this it's just telling me to eat less foods with phytic acid in it. Like what, how, how was that? <laughs> it's not specific to me. That's sort of a general right. idea. Yeah. Um, before, before we get into kind of wrapping the show up, um, what, you know, what are you focused on, uh, as far as health and, uh, performance optimization? I know, you know, jujitsu just by, just by following on, on Instagram, you know, I know how, how seriously you take your jujitsu practice. Um, what is there, is there an area or something that you're really focused on right now that, that you'd love to share? Like what's, what's got your, what's got your pants on fire? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, I like hot tubs, saunas, yeah, buddy. meditation, being outside, you know, I mean, uh, uh, 
I've definitely migrated more carnivore over time. And so like that, that kind of dietary piece, I, I think is, is pretty good. Like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shocked, but also kind of impressed with, with how that's playing out. But, um, I'm really trying to be online as minimally as possible. Like I'm really still trying to provide value to people, but at the same time, uh, I've, uh, I still have social media profiles, but I write stuff up. I send it to my assistant. She posts it, and that's it. Um, if folks want to interact, then we've got like the Healthy Rebellion radio podcast where people can submit questions or they can sign up for the Healthy Rebellion community. I just kind of hit my my saturation point of two two things really ended up chapping my ass. And I, again, this is a sign of just becoming old. But the, the one thing was um, – you know, trying to ask some good questions and like just getting kind of like railed upon and assailed. And it, it's always like these, you know, um, accounts with like, uh, you know, they've been active for like three days and they just kind of pop up to be able to like a, yeah. a, a attack and assail you and everything. But it's still, it still, it, it just wears on you. And that, yeah. that kind of got annoying. And then there was also this, this thing where um, I would spend all this time in kind of a thoughtful post talking about, metabolic flexibility or, you know, whatever. And it would get a little bit of feedback. And then I, I would do the offhand, like uh, shirtless selfie and I'm kind of old and a little bit jacked. And like, I would get all this fucking attention with it. I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> it, 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 like this is the game I have yeah. to play to be. Right. And I was like, fuck it. I'm, I'm not going to play that game, you know? And it, it maybe I don't know, maybe I'm ridiculous or whatever, but it just really chapped my ass. You yeah. Know? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to participate in this. And then more recently when like watching the social dilemma and kind of the way that the big tech platforms kind of profiteer from our suffering, like one thing that I did was take a massive step back from online, most online stuff. Podcasts have been cool in that you can discuss some topics that are a little bit more far ranging. Um, thus far, I've managed to do it without getting myself or anybody else canceled. But, you know, there's there's always hope on, on there's that. There's always hope. But, um, yeah, there's a um, so you're saying there's a chance, you yeah, know, and, yes. and uh, uh, it's possible. So I, I would say one big thing is that I even though I still make my living via online stuff, um, I've tried to I, I have really taken a massive step back and I, I've reframed all that. So that's like this is going to work for me. And mm. like if I need to go back and work in a lab or do something else, then I'll do that. But I'm just mm. not going to do the the rigmarole of of. Uh, you know, what, what seems to generally work. And ironically, that's actually paid off really well. Hmm. Like it's worked really, really well, um, both psychologically, like, um, the, the week that I deleted every social media platform off of my phone, I still had a regular work week, but I was like, this is like being on vacation. Cause I wasn't just like scrolling on that yeah. fucking thing. And, and, you know, like feeling like, Oh, I got to answer some questions. I love helping people. I love being of service, but it just felt like pissing in the wind on, you know, like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and everything. Whereas what, what I'm doing now, um, I feel like it really matters. I really have impact and the people that I'm relating with, I actually kind of get to know those people. It's not just like this drive by mugging. So mm -hmm. I would say that's been the biggest change is like re totally reframing my my relationship to social media and and making it work for myself and being willing to just completely burn everything down and and do do something else like i was uh i was looking at uh, physician assistant programs i was looking hmm. at, at uh, you know becoming a farmer like i was looking at all this yeah. other stuff and i'm like i do still really want to keep doing what i'm doing but if it's not going to work on my terms i'm going to do something else it, but so far it's it's gone well yeah that yeah. that th i think everybody should make a mental note of that that mentality just to be willing to let go of the things that aren't serving your purpose and to step away from like you, you we have agency still you know we still got some right right and, and we there was this, this shred of of, of freedom uh, and agency and, and discernment that we still can have in this in this life. And if if it's not working for you, move. If your job is making you sick and ill and a asshole, like quit it. Do something else. You know that ability to stay flexible, to to expand your conception of the world, to to to, to be able to choose how you want to interact uh, in this life that you have and with your family. I think is going to be a, 
um, it's going to be a superpower as time goes on. You know, I've, uh, I don't remember where I heard it, but there's this there, there's this distinction that I've that I've been heard heard recently. This idea that you know, for folks who are you know Gen Gen Y or millennial, you know, who who didn't grow up uh, with uh, iPads, you know, at four years old, that it, it just wasn't. I think, regardless of how much time everybody gets on there now. Um, you know, you and I didn't have iPads when we mm-hmm. were four or five or 10 or 15, like just wasn't a thing or 20, like wasn't a thing. Or 30. Yeah. Or th- <laughs> 30. For me. For me yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like this, this, this conception that the, that the primary experience of our lives is in physical form. The primary experience of our life is the um, actual conversations with actual people Physical I think interactions. This was a, a Jordan Peterson talking to that's Brett what, Weinstein. That's yeah, the one yeah, that yeah, blew yeah. my mind. Like that concept, yeah. and it sounds like Brett Weinstein's writing a book about it. And it sounds like maybe Jordan has just been also developing. You know, this is like the um, what the uh, the the hundredth, the tenth monkey idea. Like this idea mm-hmm. is starting to bubble up. That idea struck me, and it was it was so profound because I it got me thinking about how many people are making a conscious choice to allow their physical reality to be their prime the, their their primary um, um, reality versus their online reality their online avatars the you know the 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 likes that they have the followers they have the points on reddit that they have that be their prior priority yeah you heard the you heard the same thing didn't that wasn't that wasn't that amazing it, it was amazing yeah and it, it uh it we have allowed our kids very, very limited um, iPad exposure, mainly just like offline games that they play. And we even cut that recently, mm. which they're not happy about, but we're just basically like none, huh. none. Yeah. Wow. For a long, for a long time. What we are going to do, like they have these old VTech uh, cameras and, and voice recorders and everything that they had as kind of kids. They have some newer ones and they're pretty cool. Um, and, uh, they're not an iPhone, but uh, they also aren't addictive the way an iPhone is, and it doesn't track you the way an iPhone or an iPad or you know does. And so we're gonna we're gonna go that le- uh, route, and our kids may hate us at some point, but they'll have the um, they'll have the cognitive abilities to hate us and not yeah. not just be broken, you know. So right. yeah, yeah. Num- numbed out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're faced we're faced with an increasing number of 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 choices to make for for our children, you know. Which which things we're just going to go along with blindly? Which things we're going to submit to? Um, which things we're going to accept or not accept? You know, injected into us, and um, and the people who are making these hard choices, and 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 just trying to think through this into the future, what they what they want to provide for themselves and their families. I think it's it's increasingly important, man. Oh man. Good for you. Absolutely. I, yeah, we're we're uh, we're we're excited for the fall because because uh, my kids are going to be able to go back to go back to school in person, you know, right. and, and have a Waldorf uh, education, which uh, you know, there's a hundred acres on this on campus, um, so you know, they're going to be spending a lot of time outside and just ready, just ready to ready to get back to get back to human contact. Um, that that will not be a bad thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, so man, uh, Rob, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you. Um, and, and I don't, I know that you get, uh, I know that you get people, um, that, that validate and, and respect and appreciate the way that you move through the world. But I just want to just take this opportunity to, to thank you for not only the, the big ideas that you have and, and the logic that you use and the, um, the, the, the products that you're formulating and the content that you put out, um, healthy rebellion radio is such a cool, cool, like it's such a cool concept. It's such a cool format. You and Nikki do such a great job of thinking through these, these very real issues that people are dealing with and your ability and your willingness to change your ability to, to be flexible in your life is something that I really admire. And so I just, I wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for providing me a venue for, for sharing this stuff. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. So this is the the last question. It's a fill in the blank question. You may or may not remember it from last time. I do remember what your answer was. Um, so 
let's give everybody where they can find you online before I give that last fill in the blank question. Yeah. So I do a lot of writing for element and that's over at drinkelement.com. And then other than that, uh, uh, mainly, um, like I have, I'm not online really. Like there's a profile there, but I, that I throw some stuff up on. You can look around for, for those, but, uh, join dot the healthy rebellion.com is really, if you want to have a chat with me, that's, that's definitely the place to do it. Awesome. Excellent. So this is the final question. This can be based on anything that we've talked about or it can be something totally, totally off the wall, uh, but please fill in the blank. Everyone would benefit from knowing how to sleep better. Yeah. And it was probably the same one last time. It was too. the same yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was the same one. And, yeah. and we didn't talk about sleep at all in the podcast, but then you you, you hit me with that. It was just like, oh man, I, I wish we could have come back and talked about it. Uh, Rob, thank you so much, man. This is, um, again, so grateful for you. And, um, again, I love the product. Um, element has, I, it's, it's, it's solved the problem that I didn't really know that I had. And it has allowed me to go from fourth to fifth and have the energy in the afternoon to, to go on the hike with my family and, and still get the shit done get my work done. Um, I'm a huge fan of it. Everybody can go to drink element. That's drink L M N T.com forward slash O P. And, uh, the, it's a seven sample pack with different flavors. Just you pay for shipping. It's five bucks. So, um, Rob, thank you so much for joining me today on the optimal performance podcast. Huge honor. Can't look forward to doing it again. Awesome. And that's that. Awesome, man. That was great. <laughs>